tonight for the fourth installment of Villa Albertine Museum Series, a new initiative. science at NYU and started her museum career at the Guggenheim Museum in 1982. She then held many museum positions in some of this country's leading institutions, including the Lennon Museum in Lake Worth, Florida, the Hirschhorn Museum in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Bard College, and San Antonio-based Art Base an artist residency program before serving as director and CEO of the Phoenix Art Museum from 2015 to 2019. Thank you both again for joining us tonight. The discussion this evening will be moderated exceptionally by Elizabeth Smith, Executive Director of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Before turning the floor over to Elizabeth, I also invite you to join us in two weeks on May 18th for the next installment of the museum series, when we'll have the pleasure of welcoming Laurence Descartes, President of the Musée du Louvre, and Catherine Fleming, President and CEO of the Getty Trust, for another engaging discussion. 
This event will also be the occasion to host and celebrate the eight young French curators of our newly launched Museum Next Generation program. They will devote a week to visits, meetings and exchanges in major museums of New York and Massachusetts. That night, we'll also launch the call for applications for the selection of the American Curatorial Fellows who will be invited in return to travel to France this fall and attend a no less exceptional program there. Finally, I'd like to thank François Bridet, Museum's attaché at Villa Latine, who imagined and is organizing the Museum Series initiative and the entire team involved in these events. And I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the friends of Villa Bertine, in particular to Sada Sabag, Beatrice Stern, and Denise littlefield Sobel, who made this project possible, as well as Cartier for supporting the spring dialogues of this museum series. Thank you all for being with us. And Elizabeth, the floor is yours. so much. Uh, I want to say welcome to everyone. It's great to be here at Villa Albertine. Um, I'm honored to have been asked to moderate this panel uh, with these uh, two dynamic and influential museum directors, Amada Cruz and Yannick Linz. Um, I know Amada from a previous collaboration uh, that we've done, but it was my first time meeting Yannick. And when the three of us met on Zoom to talk about what we wanted to 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 discuss in this conversation. We had a very spirited uh, conversation. So I, I know that um, in that spirit, we will continue to address uh, some of the questions uh, that were mentioned, as well as others that we thought would be interesting to talk about. Um, we decided that uh, a good way to start would be to ask Amada and Yannick to briefly introduce their institutions to this group. So Amada, would you like to begin? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for having us tonight. Can you all hear me OK? OK, well, I was very curious because you saw some um, pictures from our museum earlier on. Uh, the Seattle Art Museum, although it is an encyclopedic, quote unquote, museum, was actually started in 1933 as a collection of Asian art. It actually started with a gift from a gentleman named Dr. Fuller and his wife, Mrs. Fuller. Uh, and they gave a collection of Chinese work, uh, mostly Chinese jades and snuff bottles, and then they expanded and included some other work to the city of Seattle. And they hired an architect named Charles Gould to build this quite extraordinary Art Deco building, which you serve us, uh, beautiful in a, in a park designed by the Olmsted Brothers. Uh, the museum in the park uh, is obviously a very traditional sort of model, right? Temple in the garden sort of thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience when you walk in. It was expanded right before COVID. Um, so we now have about 16,000 square feet of space for art and then some storage and other things. We also have a downtown headquarters, very much a sort of skyscraper model like MoMA. Uh, and in that place, we have 62,500 square feet of exhibition space, and it is more or less encyclopedic. Um, it was opened in 1991 with an original building uh, by Victoria Scott Brown, and then it was expanded quite substantially in 2007 by Brad Kopfel, uh, an Allied Works architecture from Portland. And then the same year, 2007, we opened our nine-acre Olympic Sculpture Park, which is on the water in Seattle. Quite beautiful. There was a photograph of it earlier on with the red calder. And that is the, the largest um, green space in downtown Seattle. And it has a really wonderful collection of about 20 works of art, all contemporary sculpture. So it's a vast museum, three different buildings, uh, just like Yummy, which is very interesting. Um, and I hope you all visit sometime. Okay, so thank you uh, everyone for this invitation. Of, of course, I'm looking to Francois, but all the team, I'm very happy to be with you. So, what about the Musée Guimet? Uh, Musée Guimet, uh, so the name of uh, Guimet comes from Emile Guimet who is the founder of this museum at the end of the 19th century. 
At the beginning, when he decided to give his collection to the state and to pay for the building uh, to become the museum and to be the first director of this museum, it was not a museum devoted to Asian arts uh, only. But uh, the idea uh, of Emile Guinet, it was in the context of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, was to focus on the different religions uh, of uh, extra-European uh, religion uh, that included at this time and still until now in his collection, Mediterranean uh, uh, objects and, of course, uh, Asian uh, objects also, but uh, devoted to uh, religious art, more or less. Um, I will not tell you in detail uh, the story, but <clears throat> the French state decided, after the Second World War, to reorganize all the national museums and then they decided to um, uh, create in Musée Guimet the National Asian Art Museum, which is now the Musée Guimet. So uh, that uh, at this time, so uh, at Musée Guimet, uh, we brought all the collection of Asian art that was in the Louvre before, because there was before at the Louvre a uh, department devoted to Islamic art and Asian art. So everything that was Asian art came to Musée Guinée, and so it uh, became the National uh, Asian Art Museum. There was an important uh, uh, date uh, also at the end of the 20th century, uh, Jacques Chirac, who was, as you know, the French president, loved Musée Guinée. And for a museum director in France, uh, it's always important to have the president of the to make a renovation. And uh, it was Jean-François Jarrige, uh, for me someone important, uh, so who was director this time of Musée Guimet, which uh, who did this uh, new presentation. And uh, uh, at this time also was including in the so-called Musée Guimet, new National Asian Art Museum, two other buildings, uh, one next to the main building, Place Diena, uh, which is called the Hotel Edelbach, so it's a very nice uh, mansion of uh, 4,000 square meters. Uh, and another museum was included uh, in Musée Guimet, but uh, his name is Musée d'Henri. Uh, Henri was uh, uh, the family that owned this collection of uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, collection, uh, but uh, in a very specific presentation that was that is the presentation of the uh, beginning of the 20th century. It was a time of Clemenceau, of Orientalism in Paris. So it's a European vision of this Asian art. So this is Musée Guimet today and uh, maybe for the future we'll speak later. Thank you both for um, summarizing uh, your institutions for us. When, when we spoke initially, I was immediately struck by uh, you know, what became very apparent that these are highly complex uh, institutions. Um, just in terms of the physical spaces alone, there are multiple buildings and with that, comes you know, challenges as well as opportunities in terms of logistics and identity and, and a whole host of things. So I wonder if you both would speak to this idea. What are some of the challenges? What are some of the opportunities that you face in um, leading uh, these complex institutions with, um, that are multi-venue museums? 
Um, I bet you want to start. So the first challenge is money. Um, it is actually extraordinarily expensive to run three different facilities, as you can only imagine. Um, you know, if you most museum directors worry about one building. If the climate control goes off in one building, someone's there, you can fix it. When you've got two buildings and a sculpture park with a small building in the sculpture park, it's another thing. Um, so that's one thing. On the other hand, um, oh, and you also have you know slightly, let's say, eccentric things to think about. When you have a big sculpture park that is actually right on the water, you worry about weather all the time. So I came from Phoenix, where we worried about the heat and the sun. So our red sculpture, in that case it was a, a Lieberman, was always getting faded by the sun. And we actually had to paint it constantly. The beautiful, iconic Calder Eagle um, that is almost defining the city of Seattle at this point, we worry about the rain. Uh, and so it's a very different thing, right? So the weather becomes something very um, immediate. Uh, in terms of the other two, um, buildings, you know, what is, what is great about having these three sites is that each one is so different. So we are actually able to offer very, very different experiences to people. If you want to have a sort of bucolic day in the park, take a picnic, and they go into the Asian Art Museum, which is gorgeous, but smaller, very human scale, because it is from the 30s, um, you have that kind of experience. It's much calmer, in a way. Uh, if you want to have a very urban experience with the hustle of downtown um, and all of that that's implicated in that, then you go downtown and you see a lot of contemporary art, modern art, um, and then the other collections as well. So that's a very different experience. And then again, if you just want to be by the water, uh, you know, not pay to go see world-class sculpture, take your dog for a walk, have a picnic, roll around the grass, um, you can do that at the sculpture park. So that is what is great about having these very different experiences for people. So about Musée Guimet, uh, maybe to start with the opportunities of having three buildings, I'm always optimistic, so it's the most important to see opportunities. Uh, of course, Musée Guimet with those three buildings and with those uh, different collection of Asian art in those three buildings, is uh, the most important uh, Asian art museum in Europe. So it's a specific responsibility also uh, to, to see how to develop uh, research programs, uh, international programs, because we have this uh, European responsibility. Uh, of course, those three buildings are very different. Uh, the main building is, uh, that you see, I think, uh, uh, here on the screen, uh, was built to be a museum. Uh, uh, so you have uh, uh, galleries uh, to present a collection, but not enough, not enough place, because we have uh, 60,000 pieces, and I hope a lot of uh, acquisition in the years to come. Uh, and the, uh, but with a nice atmosphere, with a courtyard, a covered courtyard, which is famous because it's the Encore collection. So it's a real, uh, you know, after 20 years at the Louvre, of course, the fantastic museum of the Louvre, I love to be in this very intimate atmosphere of this uh, museum. The two others are uh, ancient mansions, so we also have very specific atmosphere, and I think it's, uh, uh, I, I like the idea uh, to create uh, easy relation between visitors and uh, artworks, and I think it's, it's my opinion, it's easier in such uh, intimate architecture. So, a lot of opportunity. Big challenges, like you, of course, money, because I think even the state, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Culture, is not really conscious of uh, 
the budget we need for uh, having uh, staff uh, in each uh, building and uh, to organize rotation of the collection. So uh, uh, activity for three buildings is uh, larger than for one. Uh, <laughs> it's logic, but it's not logic in the vision of the state. So of course there is a challenge of budget and uh, maybe just uh, to, to give another challenge, uh, and it's part of uh, uh, the thinking for the future. Uh, today, you have um, uh, the main part of the collection uh, in the main building, Place Diena, and if you want to discover uh, Chinese furniture or lacquer, you have to go one uh, 100 meters uh, f uh, from the, the main building. But believe me, in the main building, uh, we have uh, more or less uh, 250,000 visitors each year. I hope more in the years to come. Uh, 100 meters uh, from this building, in the small one, we only have more or less 6,000 each year. So people, when imagine a visitor, when they do four or five levels of, uh, to visit the collection in the main building, they are too tired, they don't want to go in the other building. So it's part of our rethinking of the museum and of course, uh, so uh, you have uh, to imagine, uh, I, I would like to imagine uh, new identities, cultural identities for each building. I, I'm sure that the main building has to be the museum, but maybe the other building, uh, the third one, musée called Musée d'Henri, uh, we have a specific project with a collaboration of a foundation uh, of Japanese art and to create a hotspot not far from uh, Arc de Triomphe. But uh, so you, know, you see, the, we have to think of uh, which identity for which building, and it's uh, something new for me because. Uh, those three buildings are not uh, in the same courtyard or in the same garden, uh, so it's also a vision of uh, the place of those buildings in the city and how to be attractive from one building to another. I think this issue of identity is fascinating because it's so complex. And uh, this leads me to a related question about audience. Um, and how you are engaging with the public, um, you know, in today's society, coming out of COVID, for instance, with all the changes in today's society and with, um, you know, the shifting, well, you know, the shifting taste, the shifting interests that we observe. How are you addressing these challenges as museum leaders? What steps are you taking to try to engage with audiences, especially a younger audience? So this is obviously post-COVID because everything has changed. So it hasn't actually been that long. <laughs> so we're, I, I wish I had an answer. We're all trying to figure this out. Um, but what we are trying to do now uh, in the main space, um, because we actually started doing this at the, curator started doing this at the Asian Art Museum, was to look at our permanent collection areas and re as they are in the galleries. They have been that way for quite a while, in some cases over 10 years. And we are uh, embarking on a project of reinstalling those collection galleries with an eye towards racial equity and um, combining different time, time periods. Um, that was definitely done already in the Asian Art Museum where we do have an arrangement of galleries that is really thematic rather than geographic or chronological. Uh, so, for example, the American Art Gallery, when you think of the very traditional American art galleries, you think of the iconic sort of portrait of George Washington, right? Um, and Albert Bierstadt, something like that. And we actually embarked on a two-year project to completely re-envision those very historical galleries. And we worked with a group of community advisors, so 11 people. Some of them were advocates, um, some of them were um, 
other museum folks, some of them were academics, um, and they helped us re-envision what those galleries could look like. We also worked with three artists. One is Wendy Redstar, a native woman artist. Many of you know her, I can see. Uh, the other was Inye Wokoma, who is a very important local black artist um, who started a space called Wanawari, which is a space uh, in the historically black neighborhood of Seattle. And um, the other one is Nicholas Galanen, who many of you probably know also from Alaska. And so two of those artists actually were commissioned to do new work uh, based on this whole project. And the third, Inyo Okoma, of course local, told us he didn't want to make a new work. He wanted to actually curate one of the galleries. So as you can imagine, his gallery is as absolutely fascinating. And what he did in the American Art Gallery then was incorporate local micro histories. So for example, uh, Japanese American artists who were in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest in the 30s, for example. So there are it's, so there are now local histories of artists of color and how they've impacted what we consider American art in Seattle, um, certainly through the lens of the Pacific Northwest, but also through the lens of other types of artists that um, perhaps had not been included in the past. And also, most symbolically, instead of the Bierstadt introducing the American Art Galleries, Wendy Redstar's work is introducing you to and welcoming you to the American Art Galleries. And it is a really beautiful piece, a light piece, where she um, actually did a photo shoot of local Native women and their children. Um, and they are against the backdrop of the sort of iconic Seattle skyline. So it's very much grounds you in the local but also thinking about the local in a very different way. So that was such, such a successful project that we are actually looking at that as a model for how we go through the other galleries. And the reason that I say that in talking about this is that it has been very, very popular with younger people. So um, in my sort of, let's say, walkabouts around the city and um, conversations with younger people, interns that we have at the museum, the um, response was, I never see myself in those galleries. People want to see themselves in your museum. Um, and now they, they do. And so the response has been really, really fantastic from younger audiences. We did the same sort of thing, mixing the old and the new, the sort of iconic abstract expressionist works that we own, European modernists masters like Francis Bacon, and we mix that up with, um, with work by younger artists like Dana Claxton, also a native artist, and Jeffrey Gibson. So all of this sort of mixing things up, we are also getting a great response from younger audiences to that. So uh, as you know, I arrived less than six months ago. So our program or my ideas are not as developed as you, uh, of course. But uh, uh, the beginning of my uh, thinking is quantity. Of course, what is important is quality, but also quantity. Uh, so this museum, 20 years ago, uh, could, could have uh, 400,000 uh, visitors. Uh, last year, uh, we had a little more than 200,000. So, uh, what I think is that it's not enough. And when I say it's not enough, uh, I, I try to compare to other museums in Paris. Of course, not the Louvre with 10 million visitors, uh, but uh, Musée du Quai Branly uh, or uh, middle-sized museums. Uh, of course, it's difficult to compare because we don't have the same collection, but even big museum in region, all the middle-sized museums in Paris or uh, important museums in uh, region in France, uh, have uh, more or less 500,000 visitors. So that's why I believe and I want uh, in the years to come to have uh, between 400,000 and uh, 500,000. This is one point, quantity. Uh, but of course quality is important and I try to think with my team because I always want uh, collective uh, brainstorming uh, what could be our strategy? So our strategy to develop audience uh, will be in three directions. First of all, uh, 
of course we need in the world uh, we see and uh, with Asia that becomes the center of the world, we need in Europe uh, to, to have a sort of entrance door to Asia for young people. They need to understand, young or uh, for every people, I think, I hope that Musée Guimet could be this entrance door to, un to better understand uh, Asian civilization, Asian culture. Of course, we all know that young people love uh, pop culture, uh, Korean culture, pop culture, manga, etc. So it's a possibility maybe to see how to come to the past uh, but first, uh, from their culture of Asia to uh, deeper uh, knowledges on civilization. So, this is the first direction, young European people. Second direction, we have a lot of uh, Asian communities in France and around Paris. We have 800,000 800, Chinese around Paris. N none of them come to Musée Guimet. So uh, for me, it's a question. What about those? It's their heritage, part of their heritage. And third direction, I couldn't imagine it before coming to Musée Guimet, are the A Asian tourists. I was convinced that a Chinese tourist coming to Paris, of course, only would like to see Louvre Museum and Eiffel Tower. But I had some interesting discussion with specialists of Chinese culture. And someone very famous, I will not tell his name here, said, Yannick, don't believe this. A Chinese tourist coming to Paris like to eat uh, French sweets uh, and steak during two days, but the third day he would like Chinese uh, cooking. So you have to be attractive for, ch uh, for Chinese or in Indian, Asian tourists. So this will be the third direction. So, of course, this is the beginning of our strategy. And uh, yesterday started a new director, but uh, uh, so I could uh, choose to, to be the project manager. I, I told her uh, I have very nice experience. She was uh, before uh, director of a museum in the suburb of Paris. She did wonderful things uh, with uh, young people. And uh, I, uh, I just asked her to be creative uh, because uh, we all know now uh, old recipes, but I think we are in a time after COVID and with uh, this specific sit international situation tension everywhere, etc. We need to be creative. And uh, I know, I have seen this morning some very creative uh, things here in some museums. And uh, so, uh, this is the first rule, to be creative. In one year, I, I can start to tell how. <laughs> Um, I think you both have, have mentioned some very creative strategies that you are adopting, and I think it's so important to think creatively and think differently um, in today's world. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you one more question before we turn it over to questions from the audience. Um, I'd like you to both talk a little bit about your personal trajectory. Both of you are, you began as you know, curators or academics. Uh, both of you are specialists, deep specialists in your fields, but now, you're at the head of large museums with a complex program. Uh, and uh, help us understand how you've navigated that transition and also if there are any guiding principles for leadership that, uh, that continue to motivate you. That's such a big question. Okay, I won't go through my whole career because I've been around for a while. Um, but um, I was a curator of contemporary art for a long time, for over 20 years, um, and worked with a lot of younger artists. Now they're not so young, um, but that's what I did. And that's how um, Elizabeth and I know each other, because we co-curated a work of, uh, show of Sidney Sherman's work, many, many 
years ago. I won't say how many. Um, and so that's my background. Um, I moved into being a director at a small university museum first. And so that's at Bard College, not far from here, just north of here, which is a great way to start. I personally always tell interns that um, I think it's important to start in small places um, because you learn how to turn on the lights, you learn how to read the hyperthermograph, and like all of that stuff I think is very, very important um, to get that kind of on the ground training. Um, so I started at Bard as a director um, and then moved on from there. Um, so let's see, I th think in terms of, um, you know, being a director, a museum director, right now is very complicated. Um, and it's complicated because the world has changed in such a dramatic way. Um, you mentioned tension. I think there's, I just think people lost their minds during COVID. Um, and there is a lot of tension out there. And so I think you just have to realize that everything will pass eventually um, and try to just, just do the right thing. Um, in terms of navigating a very big museum and a big institution, um, I just think it's really important to hire very good people that are smarter than you um, and then let them do their jobs and be very supportive. So I feel like my job now, not as a curator but as a director, is to be a catalyst for other people, to be very supportive um, and to reward talent and hard work and dedication. Um, and sort of, in a way, you know, I'm the ambassador in that I'm always the one in the front, you know, on stage talking and talking to donors, especially in this country, we do a lot of fundraising, but I also feel like it's, um, it's my responsibility to push other people forward as well, because someone else has to do this job when we all decide to retire, right? So it's important to be the catalyst. Of course, uh, I share a lot of uh, what you just uh, have said. Uh, so a few words about me. I, I have a very uncommon uh, uh, parcours uh, as a French curator. And just uh, when I pass the exam, because in France, I think it's the only country to become curator. Uh, you don't only need the PhD, but also to pass an exam. So uh, I started as a teacher. When I was a child, I wanted to teach, and I love teaching. Uh, I, I tried to teach every time, even uh, when I was curator. So I, I, uh, after one year of teaching, I decided to pass the, the exam as a curator. Uh, and uh, what the ministry never understood is when I uh, passed the exam, uh, I didn't want to go to the Louvre. It was every young curator in France uh, dreamed to, to go to the Louvre. It's the place to be as a curator. And I told uh, the ministry, I, I would uh, like an experience as a director in a small regional museum. They thought that I was drunk, uh, <laughs> but I say, uh, you know, uh, I'm from um, near the border of Germany, and the German model of uh, uh, high-level cultural project shows that everything is not in the capital. You have uh, interesting. So, well, I, I, but when you s say this, you can't choose your position. So I, I was sent in southwest of France, in a small city called Agen, uh, known for the plums and the rugby. And uh, so uh, I arrived on the 1st of April, 1992. And uh, uh, <laughs> I thought in, in the first weeks that I will become crazy because uh, uh, I had a lot of uh, training, uh, academic training, uh, training in the School of Curators. And uh, I had to deal with uh, very pragmatic things. Uh, so. Uh, but in fact, so I, I thought I had to stay one year, and after I will maybe ask to go to the Louvre. <laughs> but in fact, I, I stayed there during nine years. I was very happy because I was free. In the Louvre, you are not free. When you are a young curator, you have to wait um, sometimes 
just 10 years to make your first exhibition. So there, I didn't have any money, but I could be very creative. So uh, I was. And then uh, I decided when I came back to Paris, uh, because my husband uh, worked in Paris, and so I married at this time, so it was very pragmatic. I had to come back to Paris. So uh, I, decided, uh, I decided to have a new life. So uh, I uh, entered at the Louvre, and uh, I made my PhD at this time. And uh, so uh, I bec became specialist of Iranian art. And of course, it was a very uh, interesting sequence uh, without any uh, managing uh, no one, just myself, uh, my research, etc. But I always had cycles of nine years. I don't know why, but uh, after nine years, uh, I thought uh, I need some management again, and so uh, uh, I decided to be candidate uh, at the head of the Islamic Art Department. And for my last adventure, because it should be my last adventure, uh, I, I have a contract of three years that I can have during three uh, times, so nine years, and after I, I, I should retire. So this is a very interesting position just the last job before retiring. So no challenges, just uh, to, to do what is your duty uh, in your... And uh, so, of course, I share many ideas uh, like you. So I, I, I said to the curators when I arrived, so I'm no more curator. I have a new job. You are the curators. And I, I have to organize uh, of course, all the strategies, the fundraising, to make things possible. So we have to share common dreams for this museum. I want uh, us all together to be ambitious. We have a big responsibility uh, about Asian art today, I think, in this uh, society, in this world. So. I will uh, create the conditions uh, for all of you to be uh, creative, active, and uh, this is uh, our position now. And uh, I'm, very, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really very happy in this position. My husband less because it takes a lot of time. But uh, <laughs> um, I think your, both of your comments um, reveal that it is—it's a challenging time and it's a demanding time, but it's also an exciting time to be at the head of a large, important museum, whether in France or the United States. Um, now, I know that we have some questions from this audience. I'm not quite sure how much time we have for them, but uh, the microphone will be passed to anyone who would like to ask a question. Um, sir? Uh, thank you so much for this uh, fascinating exchange. Uh, in the museum world, we talk a lot about engagement, visitor engagement um, these days. And I was wondering what your opinion was about that term and what that actually means to you. Does it mean foregrounding the visitor over the object? And what are the implications of that? OK, I'll start. I think there are lots of ways of engaging visitors. I don't have a problem with the term. I just feel like it's very broad. Um, so our mission is connecting art to life, and it's a very simple mission statement, but what I like about it is that means that we do not live in an Eiffel Tower at SAM, as we call ourselves, Seattle Art Museum at SAM. Um, and so in terms of engagement, I do think it's very, very important. You know, art is at the center of everything that we do, but we certainly want to make those connections to people's lives, and we do that in, in, in so many ways. It's sort of hard to go through all of it right now, but I do think that museums, in this country in particular, I guess, or this is all I know, I do feel like we are, many, we are concerned with the audience much more now. Right? And I think I've been reading a lot of strategic plans lately because we're going to be embarking on one soon. And it's very striking to see the difference than the ones done in the last few years in that being an audience-centered institution has become a primary concern for museums. And I think that is because we are afraid of losing relevance. That is the single, single, my, my opinion, again, 
most important challenge is how are we going to continue to be relevant to young audiences, because they are the future, when they are on their phones all the time, right? And when those virtual shows are so, so popular. So, so I, think, um, I think that's the challenge. Uh, when I see uh, visitors in Musée Guimet today, and we know it through uh, studies, recent studies, I see that uh, we only have visitors that, uh, mainly visitors that understand uh, Asian art, so collectors, amateurs. Uh, but uh, of course, we also have. Uh, tourists and uh, schools, etc. But when we ask to those other people that are not amateur, what do you understand in this museum? Which, of course, is one of the uh, nicest uh, collection uh, uh, we can see. Nothing. They understand nothing. So, uh, for me, we really have uh, its time of uh, responsibility and not only of wishes. Uh, because I started my job so more or less 30 years ago, I was always involved in audience in the museum. I, I think that in France, I, I, I really was one of the curator that was uh, really always uh, involved a lot in, in this uh, question of education in museum. I even was, uh, during uh, two years, uh, uh, advisor of Jacques Long, uh, who was minister of uh, culture and education about museum education. So, if, if, but I feel that now uh, it's time to be serious in this question and not uh, imagining always, oh, it's okay, we, because we have one uh, class uh, in a week, uh, we, uh, we succeed in, in this. So, uh, what does it mean? Uh, we don't have time to develop, but uh, we had a discussion this morning together. And uh, of course, I think it's important uh, to imagine, to, to bring knowledge, of course, uh, to have uh, text, to have contextualization, because uh, those pieces had another life before, and we need to give elements to people saying uh, those objects were in such a monument, in such a house, etc. But I think. Uh, uh, I would like to share maybe uh, some ideas we had uh, this morning. I think it's very important in uh, to to give a desire uh, to young people, but to to all visitors and desire to come back, uh, desire to have uh, this experience of museums to create surprise, to create emotion. So uh, we have a lot of work to be, again, creative to see it's, it's not done when you put an, uh, artwork in a showcase with a label. Uh, we have, of course, to have a lot of imagination and I think also what is important that is uh, often uh, forgotten is evaluation also because it's not because we have a good idea but we are sure that uh, it will be understood by the visitors so is there another question sir Thank you both very much. Amada, you have a separate museum devoted to Asian art, and of course the Guime is explicitly about Asian art. How can Asian art be made relevant to non-Asian audiences, and, and what about our response or our responsibility to Asian audiences? There are two very distinct populations that I think will be coming to our museums. One who say, this is part of my culture, one who say, I don't know anything about, as you said. And how do we make Asian art relevant, and how do we do more than just objects and labels? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
We are in Seattle on the Pacific Rim. And so we actually have a very pretty substantial Asian population um, in Seattle and in Washington state in general. Um, you know, Seattle is, um, I should backtrack a little bit, uh, it's not that diverse, but it is becoming much more diverse and the biggest population in Seattle that is not white is Asian. So it's about 17%. Uh, and that is growing. So we know that that is a population and that is a community that we are responsible to. Um, we do know that the Asian Art Museum is popular with our various Asian communities and the largest group is Chinese um, community in Seattle. So we do know that it is important for them, just like it's important for all of us to see ourselves in these collections. Um, surprisingly, we also have other communities that come to the Asian Art Museum that really love it. They might not necessarily identify with some of the works and some of the rituals and all of that, but it is actually quite popular among um, uh, other demographics, um, which shouldn't surprise us because the work is, you know, fantastic. And we also do a lot in terms of trying to educate people about what these works are. Um, and uh, we also at the Asian Art Museum have brought in contemporary artists to do some um, exhibitions. And that has proven, if you just look at uh, attendance figures, which of course we're all obsessed with, uh, those actually draw in a completely different audience and also a quite younger audience and a very big audience. I mean, everybody knows about the Kusama effect, right? We also had a very popular show with Mr. at the Asian Art Museum. Um, and so, so I don't, I actually don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's that difficult. I think just because it's Asian art, I just think art in general. The art museums in general have to worry about relevance. That's just, that's my opinion. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Yannick. Um. No, uh, uh, maybe not directly in link, but uh, I think uh, maybe to, to be more complete, I think that today we have new tools also that can be interesting for us in museums. Uh, of course, immersive uh, technologies. Uh, uh, I, I like a lot to make, uh, so now it's not my job, but what I loved when I did some temporary exhibition was it was a new way uh, to uh, make scenography of, and scenography is also, I think, important to uh, to be uh, pedagogic with uh, people to create emotion surprise. So, I think that we really have to use those new tools also to uh, to be more attractive uh, and uh, more. Uh, uh, yes, to be more attractive for new visitors. Well, I want to thank you both for your comments. Um, thank you to the audience for listening and for your comments. And please, um, everyone, let's continue the conversation over um, a glass out in the adjacent room. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>